Ladies and gentlemen, it is certainly my pleasure to welcome and introduce this morning Professor Uli Silverman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, I was just told the Commissioner that I uh, last night reread the, uh, the foreword to the book that he wrote, and boy, does that summarize where we are today and what we need to be alert to. Uh, so I thank you, thank him, and I look forward to meeting with the senior staff tomorrow. And I'd like to thank uh, Don for inviting me. Uh, I told Don that uh, this turns out to be my fourth trip to Australia. And as you, if you've made that sojourn economy, you know what it's like. <laughs> and each time we do it, we say, oh, I'm not doing this again as much as we love the country and see something new each time. But we say, oh, my goodness, uh, we were younger then. But uh, each time something comes up, uh, I, I'm very happy to uh, respond to gracious invitations, and I'm glad I did it. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will have a lot to say, unfortunately, but I will try to capture the highlights of what we found and uh, leave time for questions. I welcome your questions because there's so much involved. And I might say that uh, I don't have real time to go into it, that the consequences of this system are going on as we sit here today, right in New York. There are uh, several major uh, court trials uh, that are going on, and the major will is scheduled, it's already before the court, and the court, the trial is supposed to schedule to begin on the 11th of March. And uh, I think Chris Devery uh, meant, used the phrase unintended consequences of this system. And I believe that's an accurate way of doing it. So I'm here to tell, it's a story, it's a narrative, and as you know, in crime or in policing, there's always a story, a narrative. It may or may not reflect reality, but there is a story. Here's the beginning of the story. This is in the early 90s, and just as you in New South Wales and other jurisdictions have had their period of crises, this was a period of crises for crime in New York. You may have heard about the New York miracle, et cetera, et cetera. Getting away with murder. This is in the early. This is 1992, and you can see that uh, there's a sense of fear. Uh, or, and you name it, there were articles about how bad things are, and this is going to be terrible, and is this the end of New York? Almost that fatalistic. <clears throat> how bad is it? <laughs> I mean, it was portrayed as very bad and crime was very high. Um, in 1992, we had over uh, 2,000 homicides. Now we have, the last year was under 500, approximately 462, but I'll get into those numbers. Uh, then came be the beginning of the so-called uh, crime decline in 1994. In, in 1995. In 1994 was the beginning of what many people in policing call the most significant uh, development in policing in perhaps 100 years. That was what the commissioner was referring to, the police management system known as ComStat. And most of you know this, so I will only go through it uh, um, very briefly. Uh, the, I'm not, I, I should make it clear that as my talk goes along, I am not making the villain, Comstat, portraying it as the villain. In fact, I believe in it, and I wrote an earlier book on it, uh, probably the first one that ever addressed this new development, and it was called NYPD uh, Battles Crime, Innovative Strategies in Policing. What this story is about is how this system has been perverted or turned on its head, and I'll speak to that. So these are weak, actually, when it first started, it was twice weekly. Uh, in April of 1994, 
the, uh, it began at 7 a.m., 7 a.m., and you had to be there on time, and uh, it had all the top-level people sitting at a circular table, and in, in the audience, not really an audience, but uh, performing would be the commanders of the precincts, of the regional commanders, and they would have to, they were held responsible for crime in their areas and what they're doing about it. And the upper echelon directed the meetings, the precinct commanders were present, and they were going to be held accountable. I should say, though, what was, to me, very uh, a welcome development is that while they were held accountable, they were given the resources to deal with crime in their area. That's been taken away. That's one of the developments that I regret. But they were given the authority and the discretion to fight crime as they saw fit, as long as it was legal. Fo focus on crime control, use of computer mapping, which was displayed on screens uh, on front, and you would see what the, cr the different crimes are in your area, how it uh, correlated with the deployment of your people. If, for example, you could show on one, one uh, because I, you saw on television that the, uh, the, the uh, just uncovered a larger stash of ice here in New South Wales, and they would display <clears throat> the drugs and the uh, crime in a particular area. Then they, they would have juxtaposed with that the deployment of people in those areas. So one thing that stood out is that most of the, the uh, dealings were done on the weekend, no surprise to most people, but then you would see the hours of working for the drug enforcement narcotics unit, it's called, and they would, oh, they would have off on the weekend. It was displayed carefully. And this, by the way, was the first time in 1994 that they had up-to-date crime statistics, believe it or not. The crime statistics at that time were six to uh, six months to a year old. So it, it's, you real, the bad guys are not going to wait around so you get your information and, and plan your strategies. So that, that's what it looked like. And the mantra, the mantra of CompStat displayed on all the walls, that's what always was repeated. Accurate and timely in, uh, intelligence, effective tactics, rapid deployment, and relent relentless follow-up and, and assessment. I'm here to talk about the first one, because without accurate and timely intelligence, then the rest all fall by the wayside. If you don't have up-to-date information, then what good is it? If your crime statistics are not accurately reflecting what's happening out there, then what a lot of us do here, if we don't have faith in the crime statistics, then a lot of what I've heard yesterday, what all of us do, is, is weakened because we don't know how solid that foundation is. And in New York and some other places, um, this is a fact. I just got an email just this morning, for example, and, <clears throat> and there's an independent police complaint commission in, in the UK, and they just found that they, just, they were investigating one rape, and then they found that there were a whole bunch of rapes rapes that were cuffed, what they the UK called cuff, meaning like a magician puts something down in his or her cup, cuff. So they were crimes that were downgraded. And they, so they weren't on the, on the register, they weren't portrayed as rape. So this is not new, uh, new to New York, but as the commissioner said, it started in New York, it's emulated in many places, and and some places have also emulated the downside of this. And that's the concern I'm raising. That's what a, that's what a, a, a Comstack cover sheet looks like. And it shows those crimes there are what, what the way score is, uh, is taken in the US. That's it. If someone says our city is safe or unsafe, they go by those, what we call, seven majors of felonies. So the, uh, these are, these are uh, New York City statistics for a, a previous period. It comes out every week, and it has far more detail than this, obviously. But 
And the, actually, the book started like this in 1994. Now the book is that thick with detail. Originally, the book was given out to maybe 19 people and now has wide distribution. Not to the public. The public can get this summary information on the, on the NYPD's website. But this is a very important point, that these seven majors are the way they keep score, and almost exclusively the way they keep score. And as you know, in the public health or juvenile justice or in education, the way, way things are measured is what matters, and people are going to focus on that. And it's more likely to be distorted. It was many years ago a social psychologist uh, name of Campbell came up with what's called in the literature Campbell's Rule. The more intensely someone, uh, some measures are going to be focused on to the exclusion of others, the more likely there's going to be some problems with those measures. It's a part of it is human nature. Now, the argument was that the crime has gone down in those m number of years. Now they claim about 79% in those number of years. Um, our view is that, that that's overstated. We agree that crime has gone down, but that's overstated. We just did another, another I'll, I'll show it very quickly, another very extensive survey of all retired officers. And one of the many figures we asked them is, how much do you think, do you believe crime's gone down? Majority said yes. How much do you think uh, it's gone down? The mean was about 40%, which mirrors the US decline during the same period. Very interesting. Now, there are some people in, in the midnight, three years later, who started to raise issues. They uncovered things. There were newspaper reporters, some cops have been whistleblowers, and they said, uh-oh, there's a problem. And is this, this was from the union, the police union, Patrolman Benevolence Association, which just deals with the patrol force. And he said it's a great idea that is corrupted by human nature, and there's so much pressure to keep the numbers low. It all emanates from the top. Comstat is a neutral system, in my view. It can be used for great good, but it can also be distorted. And that's where I think we need to be vigilant. And the, he just mentioned some of the ways to fudge the numbers. Uh, discourage victims from reporting a crime. Uh, don't file reports or misclassify crimes from felonies to misdemeanors. The misdemeanors are those other crimes that we have figures on but are not publicly reported. In fact, you're, the, the, every, every law enforcement agency in the state of New York is requested to report these felony, uh, I'm sorry, non-felony uh, crimes. And they, they, everyone has had, of over 1,800, only two haven't reported for a period of time, and one was in New York City. And so when some of it was reported, for example, when burglary was going down, we then uncovered some statistics on lost property. And all of a sudden, we see burglary going this way and lost property going that way. Then they stop reporting that. Um, so this is, the, this is why we call it the numbers game. And police, like many people, are very creative. And when they, they know how you're keeping score, and if my, if my job is on the line, and some people's job was on the line, and if you're a commander, you very, the troops in the precinct house know very well how the ComStat meeting went. Because the commander would come back to the station house either very happy or very, very grumpy. And that message got filtered down. And some of that is on tape, is on tape. We need to have more summonses just round them up. We have to have more activity. Uh, we have to have more stop and frisk. And, those, and by the way, this stop and frisk went from uh, 1991, 92, from under 100,000 to last year almost 700,000. 
the number of people who have been stopped and frisked of young black males exceeds, in, in a particular age category, exceeds the number of young black males in that group. 88% of uh, people who stop and frisk the minorities, only about 1% to 2, 1 retrieve any guns, 3% retrieve any uh, weapons. So the thing is, what would a rational person do? You decide. Um, now, <clears throat> it, it's, I said to Don, it's welcome that there's his organization to monitor crime stats, because without some out independent authority in any jurisdiction, in my view, uh, unless there's transparency, if nothing's going to happen. There is a mayoral agency uh, called the Commission to Combat Crime uh, uh, Corruption. And in, in 1995, it was hearing all these anecdotes, all these anecdotes about uh, fudging the numbers, not taking reports. Uh, police would be telling reporters off the record. And there were all these stories. So this commission, a mayoral agency, went to the police department and said, we'd like to look at your statistics. Hello. Um, nice speaking. And they refused. This commission did not have subpoena power or the power to grant immunity to police. And no, not very few police, understandably, are going to be willing to testify without that immunity. So this, this uh, the, the head of it was not some left-wing academic. He was a respected former prosecutor. And he resigned. This is an example of the lack of tran uh, transparency. I'll skip over this. Um, and the Comstat meetings, by the way, used to be open to pe other people in law enforcement or academics. Now it's closed. So we, how did, why did we do this study? A, when I updated the previous book uh, in 2001, I've been hearing a lot of stories, and I've talked to people, so I added an epilogue raising my concern. My co-author, John Eterno, who is a retired captain and a PhD, uh, teaches at Malloy, he had also heard numerous stories, and he approached me to collaborate with him, and I didn't know what I was getting into. I really didn't, because the, if, you, if you come out in the press and when our, our, our first study was reported on the front page of the New York Times in February of 2010, front page of a Sunday Times, that gathers a lot of attention, believe me. And it circulated throughout the country. And then we were the recipients of very vitriolic editorials by police departments, which, which are closely affiliated with the police. Uh, editorials of newspapers that are closely aff affiliated with the police department. One, 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 edi one editorial said anti-cop lunacy. Uh, uh, mugging Comstat was another one. So as I said, I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't think we would be warmly embraced. I'm not that naive, but I underestimated. So we did this study. I have more detail in the articles. But we first study, we looked at uh, retirees of captains and above. That's a higher rank here, uh, patrolman, uh, sergeant, lieutenant, captain. And then uh, the captain and above that is deputy inspector, inspector, uh, and three levels of chiefs. And then uh, deputy commissioner and police commissioner, several deputy commissioners and a police commissioner. So these are the managers. These are the key managers of this level, from captains and above. And um, we, we, we surveyed them. Now, we surveyed them only because my co-author was a retired captain, and he had access to the list through the Captain's Endowment Association, the uh, union for that, for all those all people, of the captains and above. And uh, by the way, when that came out, the mayor said, well, what do you expect from a survey uh, sponsored by the captain's uh, union? That was his phrase. In reality, we made up the entire survey except for a couple questions they wanted on membership. And 
we funded it through a grant. So <clears throat> the only involvement they had was providing us with a list. But that didn't stop uh, misrepresentation. So um, this is very briefly. I, I, we, had, we did a, lots of correlations. But the, we first divided up into the pre-Comstat and Comstat period. And you could see that the pressure increased during the Comstat period. The Comstat period was 1995, the first full year and forward. Uh, you could see the other interesting thing is the pressure uh, for integrity. How, do, how did you feel? How much pressure was there from abro abro above to have uh, uh, crime statistics that were accurate and reliable? And you could see that that declined. Uh, then we asked people if they were aware of changes in crime reports. Now, as you all know, crime reports can be changed for good reasons or bad reasons. Things might change, develop, it was, it was poorly done, or more information that would uh, emerge. But nevertheless, of those who are aware of these changes, they said almost two-thirds, let me put it this way, almost almost three quarters really, almost three quarters felt that they were strongly unethical or moderately unethical charges, changes. This is just an example. Oh, and they, they were invited to write any comments they wanted. And we've, we've sorted through that. I might also say that we've interviewed over 50 people, current and retired, and, I, and it's amazing the emails we get. It, it really is amazing. Uh, without, I say this with great humility, they, some people write us and say, keep up the work, no one else is really doing it. And there are the low level officer on the street or above him or her, they don't like doing this. They don't like doing that, but the pressure just emanates from the top. Uh, so they would, anything to move it from the felony category to the misdemeanor category. I was telling someone just the other day, a retired detective wrote about this, and this was in the press. He was a first grade detective, highest level. He, he caught someone and arrested that person for rape. That person then admitted to six previous rapes. He then went, Officer Hernandez was his name, he then went, is publicly known, he then went to check the records of the six previous cases, and they were all downgraded to something else, like forcible touching. Uh, so with this, this example today with the Met, this new, new, new report, you know, rings a bell. Uh, or they would, they would try to get the complainant to change the, uh, the uh, complaint. We have on tape an officer, someone said, oh, my car was stolen. GLA, Grand Loss in the Auto. And the officer says, and this was not a, a model citizen. He said, well, what's, the, and he knew that. He said, uh, so what's happened before? Well, here I would see these other things on your record. Yes, I did that. I paid the price, but this nevertheless happened to me. Well, maybe, and the officer said, well, maybe this is just justice. Yeah, and that's on tape. I'm not making this up. Uh, and again and again, we get these kind of comments. Any way to drive the numbers down. And this is far more prevalent than any official uh, accounting. Uh, oh, we looked at emergency assaults from the hospital. And it's at the same time, assaults were going down in the police lexicon. They were going up. Uh, in hospital data. Uh, when we got a hold of non-index crime, those crimes other than the seven majors I indicated to you, uh, you would see that would be a disparity. They went sharply down in the early years and then started to go up. But many times they were not reporting it. Uh, this, 
I mentioned Hernandez. This is a woman, Debbie Nathan, who came to us early on. She was a journalist, uh, uh, author of books, very articulate woman. She was in a park in Upper Manhattan, and someone there was an attempted rape. She tried to get the police to recall uh, to come. They were very delayed. And by the way, the 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 officer finally came. And he was on, on the phone with the specialist squad, the street crime, I'm sorry, the sex crime unit. And they're the ones who instructed this officer to record it as forcible touching. And it was so egregious that the commanding officer had to recant, recant it. They had a meeting in, the, in their district with the commanding officer, the assemblyman, and other politicians. Who, who said, this, is, this has been going on repeatedly and nothing's happening. And as I said, the more the system seems, the longer the system is in place, it, if it's so driven by political considerations, then this is bound to happen. What's happened in New York is that when crime was so high, when, when you had 2022 homicides, when you had cr high crime for assault, robbery, burglary, it was much easier to drive crime down. I liken it to sque uh, squeezing an orange. When you first try uh, squeezing an orange, you can extract juice pretty readily. But the longer you squeeze it, the more difficult it is to extract that juice. And you have to hide harder and harder and harder. So what's happened to these commanders is they're measured totally by the same period last year or last week. So if you, if you had a good year last year, it's going to be make it tougher for you this year. You not only have to maintain the decline, but you have to increase it. And politicians and mayors have now hitched their wagon to these crime numbers and said, because it's politically potent, it's for business, for tourism, for everything. And now, in fact, the numbers that are reported, are all these numbers uh, are reported twice a year to the FBI, and the FBI comes out with its report. And repeatedly, the New York uh, public statements are, we're the safest big city in America. First of all, the crime, the FBI at the outset says, these are not for comparison purposes, no matter. But so. This kind of thing can happen many times. Uh, uh, we authors advise not to take reports of robberies unless victim willing to go to the station house, which should not be the uh, process, uh, procedure. Uh, no report uh, if they don't go to the squad. Squad means a detective unit. Uh, this is self-explanatory. Uh, question victims, callbacks being made by supervisors not to report if they think the district attorney will not prosecute. It's not the officer's job to determine whether or not the district attorney will prosecute. The district attorney's office is, is required by law to use his or her own discretion. The police officer should not assume the role of the district attorney. So these are some of our findings, um, which I mentioned now, we, as I said, we did this more recent survey, which we're just analyzing the data, but it's very powerful. And what we did here, because we felt that this system has gone downhill, and all the stories that we heard and all the anecdotes we heard is that the more recent years, it's been worse. The pressures have increased, and, the, and so we divided the ComStat into two periods. We did the pre-ComStat uh, before 1995, and then we did 1995 to 2001. Now, the reason we selected that cutoff period is because 2002 came in a new mayor and a new police commissioner who was still there, and who came in and said, not only we will hold the crime decline, but we will improve on it. And so then we added this period. Here, and then we asked the retirees 
the, the majority of them lack confidence in the accuracy of the crime statistics. The pressure to increase summonses, stop and frisk, arrest, decrease index crime, and downgrade index to non-index crime increased. And this, this Kelly Bloomberg is a 2002 to the present. We did it through 2012. And uh, as I said, the stop and frisk is may, this is a stop and frisk issue, may be something that may possibly unravel part of the system. Because there are three major class action suits, as I said, before the courts. And on one of them, the, the court, this was, uh, very briefly, the one that they, the judge already ruled on was a, what's called a ta trespass assistance uh, project. People who owned uh, housing buildings, apartment buildings, generally in, in lower class areas, but private, would sign an agreement with the NYPD to allow stop and frisk within the confines of these private buildings. And what, they, and what this case was a class action suit by residents of these private buildings against what they feel were discriminatory and unreasonable stop and frisk. It's, supposed to, it's called stop, ask, and frisk, but it's basically known as stop and frisk. And the testimony by someone who's analyzed this quite, quite detail was enough to convince the judge that this was, uh, they were just stopping people coming in and out with no grounds. You're supposed to have reasonable suspicion, I know in our country and other countries that's a vague phrase and it can cover lots of things. But the judge in this case com concluded that many cases were not reasonable suspicion and you couldn't just stop people because they were entering or leaving a building for no other reason. And she also found that the, the uh, training in regard to this that the police officers received was misleading. Uh, she's put a stay, a hold on this order until the other court cases are all um, adjudicated. The, the NYPD made the argument that it would be too cumbersome to retool the training now, uh, especially with these other cases coming up. So, but nevertheless, her, her ruling stands and depending on how these other court cases are held together. The judge has also held that the uh, plaintiffs for the three court cases can now suggest, if her ruling, if she declares some of these unreasonable, that they can suggest a remedy. And a remedy in, in our lexicon would be a, uh, a monitor, or uh, oversight, some, and they all know that you can't just say, do it and it will be done. So some oversight. Now, as you know, many police departments in the US have these oversights, justice appointed or court appointed. So this has been argued for many years. There are many groups who are, who are working for this. We have an upcoming mayoral election and the different candidates are now asked their position on this. So this is a major, uh, the, stop, the stop and frisk pressure from 9% before ComStat to over 35% in this re recent era. That's an enormous increase, enormous increase. I might also add that we did an analysis that the argument is it's, it's essential for crime reduction, but we did an analysis that demonstrated the largest crime reduction occurred when there was a smaller level of stop and frisk. So th this kind of system, what happens here is, is that when there's a, a driving force, you, ComStat can now be used in this way to monitor. There's nothing that the, the powers to be don't know what's going on out in the field without this management accountability system. They have for the first time act data. They know who's doing what. Before the system came abroad, by the way, a commander didn't even know how many in his, his office 
or her office, how many arrests they had, what was their summons activity. They didn't know. It was first presented to them in a CompStat meeting. Now, you might have heard about these meetings, though some people have been there from abroad, and they were very brutal in the beginning. Some would argue they needed to be because this was a big ship that needed to be turned around. But nevertheless, the, my own opinion, and I've been to, I, I estimate over 200 of them. And in fact, the people used to, cops used to say to me, <laughs> I would come in from the suburbs and have to be there at 7 in the morning, and they would say, I have to be here. You <laughs> don't have to be here. But it was, a, it was quite a revelation. And a lot of good things came about, from it. So I'm not getting against performance measurement, but I'm for performance measurement that's not exclusively on a few items. And I know in some of the forces in this country, it's in multiple indicators. And you need to have indicators on what the community confidence is, on the support staff, how much are they helping out in this enterprise of this police department. But that is not the thrust, because the whole narrative, the whole story being told is pitched to a certain goal. Uh, this, is, this is the common, the, the comments are incredible. Un incredible, the candor of, the, of these people is incredible. And they would talk about assault would be downgraded to harassment. Robbery becomes grand larceny. Burglary becomes criminal trespass. All with editing, creative writing on complaint reports by supervisors after the submission, after the very submission. So this was endemic. It wasn't, there have been a couple times, there's one that was recently uh, caught. Many have been caught, but uh, there's some that have really made the news. They've made the news because you had whistleblowers. And we have one whistleblower in one precinct who, you're going to think I'm making this up, but he, was, he tried to go through the police channels, didn't work, he went to the press, he tape recorded some of these instructions during roll call in the precinct. On Halloween night, uh, 2010, police entered his apartment, uh, his apartment including a deputy chief, very high ranking, why a deputy chief would go there to tell him he had to go to back to work. He, called, he said he was sick and he had left work. And they said, if you don't go back to work, we're gonna, we, we consider you emotionally unstable. Emotional, EDP, as they call it, emotionally disturbed person. He was carted off to a psychiatric ward. This is USA. And and he remained there for six days against his will. His, his family was not informed. His father called every hospital in the city, which is quite a few, till he found out he was there. There's a multi-million, you know, very substantial lawsuit, but till, still to this day, he, you know, he was suspended without pay, so he's, he's essentially impoverished, living with his father upstate, and there are even tapes of police coming to his house. There are tapes of the police forcibly object, ejecting him, and, and you could hear that they, he had two tape recorders going. And they saw one, so they confiscated it. When, but there was another hidden one, which has the encounter right on tape. Now this, to me, what's quite disturbing is not only the, the happening, but the relatively limited attention to it in the press. But I've been disappointed in the press <laughs> in many places, so it's not unique. But this is an uh, incredible story. And oh, by the way, the Internal Affairs Bureau, about six months ago, someone leaked from that bureau a report which essentially uh, agreed with the bulk of his allegations about downgrading crime and just stopping people. And one, one or two newspapers reported on, on that. So this is quite amazing. And there, ha there are tapes of that going on. His name is Schoolcraft, Adrian Schoolcraft. 
He has this lawsuit going, <coughs> but you know, this can go on forever. Um, so these are just some of the examples that I, I would point to. And, uh, and they're, they're just legion. So my time is wi winding down. What do we, what, what should every jurisdiction, in my opinion, be concerned with? They, they should have, there, there needs to be transparency. No organization is, you know, we see this in education, we see it in hospitals. There was just a report in the British press about hospitals hiding debts. I mean, this, this stuff goes on. And unless there's some transparency of the organization, people are not going to have confidence in the police. And the public is not going to have confidence. And they're not going to make reports. And police are ultimately dependent on the public. And if the, pub uh, I'm, uh, and if the public doesn't have lost trust, then you're destroying the effectiveness of the police department. And there are certain communities in New York that feel it's futile to report. Or they're fearful. Uh, there's a great disparity among the communities where they, these feelings are. So, also, in the early days, they were open to even uh, community leaders in the area because they, were, they found it very educational. You know, if, if someone then went to the press, they were no longer. The former, the former deputy commissioner, one former deputy commissioner went to Philadelphia. He opened it up. One of the things we have from the New York experience is that many of these top-level people have fertilized and like a bee and spawned out to other jurisdictions. So the New York model has gone many places. We have a, right now in Chicago, which is, which is greatly concerned with its murder rate, is a former deputy commissioner, one of the chief inquisitors of the Comstat. And information I'm getting from there is they're not too happy with the openness or how even the more even a recent redefinition of what is actually a homicide. We have other information about the homicide count, but we're still correlating it. But there, all I would say is it's very difficult to have confidence in these statistics when there's so much evidence that it's going on. Uh, that's the end. That's the book. Um, so. Lastly, what I'm saying is that this management system was designed and worked to get the different units speaking to one another. As you know, in any large organization, there's segmentalism. They're, they're divided up into different root, units, and they, each one wants credit, and they don't, often don't talk to one another. This system made the units talk to one another in a common language. But unfortunately, the narrow focus that made sense then, in my opinion, does not make sense now. And I, I, I have contact with many of the people in the original Comstat who worked in that Comstat unit, or just appall what's happened to it. So people, you know, people say to me, "Well, Eli, before you were Comstat, now look at you." And what I'm saying is that Comstat, it's not I who have changed; it's Comstat that has changed. And it's become a top-down, centralized, cookie-cutter approach. And local command, if you're a commander or a borough, which have, say, had 10 precincts in it, if you want to uh, move Smith to precinct A to, and Jones to precinct B, every little decision has to go to the top level, the commissioner. How's that for micromanaging? Uh, so if you, to me, micromanaging doesn't, provide an aura of confidence in the people below. So the people below are getting buffered, but yet they know how score is kept, and so they're compelled to play this crime numbers game. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, all right, yeah, sure. Oh, thank you. Of Eli and, 
and you may even want to ask me what protections we've got against that sort of thing happening here. But first over to Eli. Questions? The audience. Must have been a big night last night. Yes, Jackie. How the authorities responded to your book, or whether you got any response? Oh, response to our finding? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could show you an email, but I <laughs> that I got, um, which captured it. I've been asked to be, um, what they call in the U.S., an expert witness to the main case based on our surveys. So. They, they have responded by demanding everything. We don't want to, we want to give this stuff, and this is all just on stop and frisk. So we have been through the runner of the attorney, they demand it through the plaintiff's attorney, the plaintiff's attorney calls me and my co-author, and they just inundate. The, uh, they are, the, like a, they have a department of public information Sort of like Orwell's department. So they're, they're, the head of it, the head of it is, is a, a genius. I know I've had conversations. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. The day that first report was coming out in the New York Times, the New York Times calls the police department and says, this is what we're going to run a story. Do you have any comment? So the, the, the comment, oh, so the head of the public calls me and says, Eli, you haven't told us how many uh, chiefs uh, uh, retired in 1994, how many captains in 1996, and blah, blah, blah. Well, it's a very simple. I said, well, you know, I couldn't do it because, and he says, oh, yes, otherwise it would be anonymous. It wouldn't be anonymous. We promised them anonymity, and we've honored that. If I violate that, then my word is not good any place, any time. And I'm aware of that. So if I told them how many deputy chiefs retired in such and such year, they would know that that person responded. So he got it right away. He's very, <laughs> I don't need to explain it to him. But in the press, he made the same comment. Well, they didn't even tell us. That's illustrative. Or to say, you know, the, the favorite word is the study is flawed. There's another one who did study of, stop and frisk, it's flawed. He's an excellent statistician. And they're saying it's flawed. They gave it to another. Or the other way is to bring in academics um, who, who are in their camp, who they give special access to, and then critique. I, I had a footnote there. I, I skipped over it. They, they, they would say, well, there was a study, there was this NYU, New York University study of our, of our uh, audit our system and found that our audit system worked very well. Maybe I can just find that slide. Um, if you could put it back on. Um, I just want to. I missed it. Anyway, he said that, oh, there it is. Th there's an example. They, they also said, well, there's the Smith and Pertel uh, uh, study, which found that it, uh, we had a great system. The footnote on, however, no one paid attention, footnote two, our conclusions are based on conversations with senior command staff. We only infer how written procedures were implemented. That was a footnote in the study that they cited. But nevertheless, no one, unless you read the damn study, you would know that that was footnote. Or I'll give you another example. We were invited, there was an international uh, meeting at the college in conjunction with the FBI that on crime statistics. And they had invited people from many countries, about 15, 20 people. That was it. Just everyone had to make a presentation. So they asked us to make a presentation. Well, we've been, the press is 
been, we've been in touch with the press a lot. They asked if they could come to our presentation. I said, let me check with one of the sponsors. I don't want to break protocol. That's their decision. I got their permission. The day of that, of that conference, there was an article in the Daily News saying, professors to tell FBI that the crime statistics are junked or misleading, or I forget what word they used. That, I can't prove it, but most people assume it. The press then came to get into the college and were CBS, New York Times, uh, several other newspapers were kept away at the door. And we, were, we did one interview with ABC outside, not your ABC, but a different ABC outside the, during the lunch hour. But, oh, and then when we, we went to a reception the day before the conference, and there was the same Dennis Smith. I'm saying, he's not on the program. So I, I get a li there a little late the next day, and as soon as I get out, out of the uh, bus station and I'm walking to the college, I get a call on my cell, and John is my co-author is saying, Eli, where the hell are you? Dennis Smith is giving a presentation. It wasn't even in the program. And, and his side, and then when we gave our presentation, he just was vibe. The level, the intensity, to me, bespeaks. The lawyer wrote me yesterday and said, I know it's not relevant what they're doing, but this, you have to understand this is to keep Eli out. They don't want me. But I have to, and maybe they'll work, it'll work, because it's exhausting. Don't, they have a whole, they have 30 some odd people, you know, and they have the city lawyers. I'm no match for them, <laughs> that, so I think that. Um, just one other thing, what, uh, so I'm from the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research, and we, um, one of the ways we validate our police statistics is to look at competitive victim survey results. Yeah. I don't know if you do that. Yes, we do do that. Some of them are accurate, some are not. Uh, we've looked at it in some areas is discrepancy even there, but they won't acknowledge that. I, I wondered what you think this means for, for new managerialism. Well, it's, New managerialism, you know, I'm, I'm all for performance. It's, you know, what you do with it. Uh, you know, you know what, there's a saying, what, what, uh, what gets counted matters. So you have to say what to do, and you have to have a system where other people are welcome into it. If it's just a top-down system, I mean, all police departments are paramilitary. I understand that. But there's an, a, there's an effort to be inclusive. And if you're not inclusive, how the, the local police officer, see if he feels that, or she feels disrespected, how they can interact with the police out there. Or if the police out there just have to get their numbers. And they, and they actually are told how many each day. And, uh, and the police say, well, that's not a quota. It's a pro productivity goal. That's the, uh, that's the nomenclature. It's a productivity goal. But there have been other cases where the courts have ruled that these are, are in fact, quotas. But nevertheless, if it, it's new managerialism gone awry. Uh, and it, we see it, in my view, in all aspects of society. We see it in, in our country, it was called No Child Left Behind, so they were teaching to the test. And you were measured on the test. We see this in hospitals. In New York City, just announced a major performance-based system for, for doctors. I mean, there's a, I know people are resistant. When I worked at the Justice Department, we tried to do some of this with the lawyers, the attorneys, and any professional is going to, you know, what do you know about my profession? You know, it's my discretion, my profession. So there has to be a sound, open system that's subject to revision. But to be wedded to a few uh, items that have other, you know, the police are important for controlling crime, but they're not the only. And when the police keep saying, we've lost uh, several thousand, we were up to one point at 39, 40,000, and now it's approximately 33,000. And all they say is, we can control crime regardless of the number of people 
we have, regardless of the conditions, because, you know, we're great. And therefore, you're wedded to this narrative. They become wedded to this narrative. The narrative is sold. I must admit I had some role in that, admit, honestly. But the narrative has been so sold that it, you're stuck to it. You know, there are many, by the way, there were many people I knew in the police department at high levels that said, we should have declared victory at a certain point. And said, you know, there might be some fluctuations. And, the, and no police department, you know, criminologists talk about cyclical patterns of crime. You know, are you gonna, are you gonna break every, <laughs> every rule of criminology, every observation? That's the, that's, that's the role, and we are the police. Uh, actually, one of the in initial things is we're not report takers, we're the police. That's a saying that one of the officers, one of the high-ranking people came up with and then put it on the wall. We're not report takers, we're the police. Well, I, th I thought you were also supposed to take a report. <laughs> so. Following on from that, whether it's 40% or 79% or somewhere in between decrease in crime and serious crime, uh, something's happening. Oh, yeah. Um, is it, is it uh, predominantly Comstat? Is it a, a combination of economy, of incarceration? D does Comstat feature, though? I think Comstat played an important role at the outset because it was able to guide the changes. And some of the changes were to away with certain layers. Some of the changes were granting people more authority. I mean, there were, uh, and I also believe in an iterative process. If the police help a certain area and the, and the, the area improves in conditions, that helps the crime conditions. So I think it works both ways. There, an article just came out, and I, I haven't read it, but this, and he's a respected uh, sociologist. He just claimed, and, it, and your question reminds me, he just did an article, and he claimed he looked at every aspect of the changes, felony assaults, misdeme uh, felony crimes, arrests, misdemeanor. I only saw a summary of the article, so I can't judge it. But I know his conclusion and Comstat. He, he claims that none, his analysis, none of these factors made any change. And at the end, he said, why was it changed? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that was his conclusion. Um, I haven't read the analysis. But my own view is, uh, yes, it was a combination. Comstat was able to guide this. And that's an important thing, because the top level didn't know. Many cases, the top level didn't know what the lower level was doing. Or the lower level didn't know the top level. I saw great things happening when the top level was interviewing. Don't forget, you have, you have a large police department with a lot of precincts and a lot of people. And for the first time, they were identifying precinct commanders. And every precinct commander had a profile which had the, their statistics, where they were working, what the nature of the community. So when it came to promotion basis, I'm not saying there was never favoritism. I mean, that's every place. But I saw a greater ability to move people who were young and good and assertive and bright. And, it, and it, they had a large repertoire of bright people. But they were allowed discretion. I'll give you a very good example. They uh, had a white uh, precinct commander in one, and he, 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 he was a precinct commander of a black, predominantly black, middle class district, uh, precinct. And the instructions came on from uh, above to do X number of road stops periodically in place to place. So I, I said to him, I had a conversation, I said, are you doing that? He said, no. He said, because my precinct feels that's harassment. He, he said, I, and I said to the leaders of the precinct, look, even my wife was stopped. They said, no matter, based on past history, they find this discriminatory. I said, what did you do? He said, I stopped it. I need their, their law-abiding citizens. I need their trust. I, I need their cooperation. And I'm willing to take on the top to do that. I, I don't see that happening 
very publicly now. It's, the, the, the person would say, look, I'm getting results. Judge me by my results, not by my activities, how many arrests, summons, et cetera. And a lot of them are meaningless. A lot of them are dismissed by the district attorney. But nevertheless, I have my numbers. So I don't care. I have, I have my numbers. I, sa I satisfied the boss. <laughs> and everyone's happy, except the people who were stopped discriminately. So there's a, a lot of factors. This is, you know, in the old days, we used to have criminologists. I remember the old days, the criminologists would always say, we'd go to these meetings and say, why is crime in always going up? Now there's a new cottage industry, and we have criminologists going to say, why is crime always going down? <laughs> You pay your money, and, I, and my wife used to say to me, are you going to another one of these conferences? I said, well, there are different players. She, she said, I, I've heard this record before. She said. <laughs> That's fantastic. Would you join me in giving Eli a warm <laughs> Thank you.